On behalf of Southern Methodist University's Richard B. Johnson Center and the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, welcome to this luncheon conversation on the economic effects of policy uncertainty. My name is Evan Koenig. I'm an officer uh, in the research department here at the Dallas Fed. We're in for a real treat because each of the three people here on the stage with me is known for his eloquence and insight. Dallas Fed Richard Fisher, Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher, has been representing this region at Federal Reserve policy meetings in Washington, D.C. since 2005. He has a record of success in the private sector and in public service. Thanks partly to his many business contacts around the country, Richard is exceptionally well informed on the actual impact of government policies. He is widely respected for his sound judgment and for communicating his views on the economy and policy clearly and forthrightly. John Taylor is the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford. He has been a role model and mentor for a whole generation of Federal Reserve economists and has done as much as anyone else to close the divide between the academic and policy worlds. Besides being a brilliant economist and a dedicated public servant, he is an outstanding teacher and a kind and generous human being. Mm -hmm. Nick Bloom, who will be moderating these proceedings, is a colleague of John's at Stanford. His theoretical and empirical research on policy uncertainty and its economic impact has been hugely influential and has caught the attention of the business and popular press. The format is simple. Richard and John will each present 15 to 20 minutes of prepared remarks, and then they will discuss questions from the floor. Richard, the Thank podium's you. yours. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. First, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here with Nick and John. Nick has a great resume. My favorite part of it is he notes at the very bottom that he's an Englishman married to a Scot and has three American children. And as he says, he lives in a multilingual English household. I love that. Um, and it's a great pleasure to share this platform with John Taylor. I first met John at a, it was a Carnegie Foundation seminar. You may not remember John. You were Under Secretary of the Treasury. And I have been among the legion of admirers of yours ever since. He's, as Evan said, he's thoughtful, he's no nonsense, he's a great teacher. And very, very importantly for this institution, he is totally dedicated to making monetary policy as efficacious as possible. Uh, we at the Dallas Fed, by the way, are very grateful that he chairs our Globalization and Monetary Policy Institute. It has the unfortunate acronym of GIMPY, which I don't like. Um, but it is an important research institute. John was kind enough to take the chairmanship with the board of advisors of that. But more broadly, as Americans, uh, we are grateful, John, for your service and dedication to our country. So I want to thank you for being not only the good man that Evan mentioned, but a great patriot. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So the subject is uncertainty. And here's the essence of my speech. Uncertainty matters a lot. Now, this wouldn't surprise most of you. The first thing you're taught in an MBA program I'd be at a Stanford where I earn my degree and Nick teaches and also we have John as a great professor or anywhere else is that business is decision making under conditions of uncertainty. All business executives worth his or her salt, their salt, organize their teams and resources to minimize uncertainty of factors under their control and they develop contingencies and operating tactics and strategies for factors over which they have no direct control. Obviously, uh, the less clear external influences are, the greater the degree of angst about budgeting and planning for the future. Even the saltiest of helmsmen at sea cannot confidently navigate a ship in the fog. Well, going back to the earliest days of the current recovery, my business contacts, which Evan referred to, have regularly complained of a fog of uncertainty emanating from Washington. 
They've consistently cited fiscal and regulatory uncertainty as major impediments to capital investment and expanding payrolls. Given uncertainty about the implications for overhead of the Affordable Care Act and other government mandates, they've complained of not knowing what their all-in labor and other costs will be and how that lack of knowledge has made long-term employment planning nearly impossible. I've spoken about this, I have in my notes here repeatedly, the truth is ad nauseum, and I'm sure many of you heard similar complaints or voiced them yourselves. What you may not realize is that until recently, economists who study business cycles and monetary policy paid scant attention to the effects of uncertainty on aggregate job and output growth. The profession's standard models assume that the economy is populated with households and firms that are identical to one another, or that people and businesses can insure away individual risk, and so are effectively, theoretically, identical. It's become standard practice, too, to assume that decision makers are hyper-rational in how they form their expectations of future policy and future events. In other words, they're assumed to fully understand, as though anybody can fully understand, how the economy works. Now, to be sure, the economy is subject to shocks, so that its course is unpredictable. We know that. But that uncertainty, according to this school of theory, is of no real consequence for a household's decisions on how much to save and consume or a business's decisions on how much to hire and invest. The technical term is certainty equivalence. In standard models, choices depend on what you expect will happen and not on the degree to which you are confident in your predictions. Such thinking is, of course, far removed from reality. And thankfully, there's increased recognition of that fact. A variety of uncertainty indices have been developed and their importance in theory and in practice examined. Pretty uniformly, these studies suggest that changes in uncertainty have significant economic effects and that uncertainty has been elevated in recent years. In theoretical analysis, the impact of uncertainty is especially great when realistic financial and informational frictions prevent risk from being spread optimally. Because of such frictions, for example, debt contracts, uh, contracts often require that borrowers post collateral. When uncertainty increases, so do the collateral requirements, tightening credit and increasing the value of safe assets relative to other assets. Of course, there's more than one kind of uncertainty. There's uncertainty about future average tax rates on investment income, for example, or the future pace of average labor productivity gains. This is, of course, aggregate uncertainty. There's also uncertainty that widens the distribution of asset returns across firms or the distribution of income prospects across households while leaving aggregate average asset returns and aggregate average productivity prospects unchanged. This is known as cross-sectional uncertainty. Finally, there's the uncertainty that you feel when you think that you understand how the world works, and then you discover you don't because something happens that you thought was completely unlikely to happen. In the extreme, these are the black swan events, what we here at the Dallas Fed call the O-spit. Now, that's a P, <laughs> not a... The O-spit moments that we experience when we realize that we have fundamentally and disastrously miscalculated. Black swans induce paradigm shifts. The world, or at least our thinking about the world, is never the same again after they occur. For example, the Great Depression was one such event. The housing market collapse that began in 2006 and then spilled over into the financial markets is another. If the U.S. government defaults on its debt later this month, we'll have a third example. The unthinkable will have become real. And the full faith and credit of the United States will be a mirage rather than an accepted, dependable fact. There are myriad other events that on a smaller scale lead people to questioning the under, their understanding of the rules. For example, the recent decision of the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, which I serve on, a decision to maintain the pace of its large-scale asset purchases in the face of a generally improving labor market outlook and, at the time, widespread perception within financial markets, right or wrong, that the Fed had telegraphed a dialing back of the rate of purchases may have increased uncertainty about the future path of monetary policy. That was one argument raised 
against the decision not to taper. I know that because I made that argument at the table. <laughs> and I was not alone, so we'll see if that was correct or not. Most real-world fiscal and un regulatory uncertainty is a mix of both aggregate and cross-sectional uncertainty. Given the aging of the U.S. population, we know that revenues required to finance entitlement programs will certainly have to increase in coming decades. Entitlement reform may uh, ameliorate the problem, but it's not going to eliminate it. Government purchases will have to be cut relative to baseline projections, and tax revenues will certainly have to be increased. But exactly which programs will be cut and which taxes increased and when is unclear and has been, of course, we all know, further muddled by the behavior or misbehavior of fiscal policymakers these past few days. The financial crisis and subsequent recession exacerbated these problems by increasing the outstanding stock of debt. Here's some statistics for you. U.S. federal government debt held by the public has increased from 34% of potential GDP at the business cycle peak in the first quarter of 2001, shortly before the 9-11 attacks, to 36% in the fourth quarter of 2007, just prior to the Great Recession, to 70% of potential GDP today. This increased debt has been manageable, but as a result of a substantial fall in interest rates. Indeed, interest on the public debt has trended downward from 4.7% of potential GDP in 1990 to 3.2% in 2007 to just 2.1% in 2012, as the average interest rate on Treasury securities dropped from 9% to 5%, and then to its recent level of 2.5%. I have posited that rates obviously cannot continue to fall. Though, so the cost of servicing debt is sure to increase, even if the size of the debt relative to the economy stabilizes, this is another uncertainty factor. It's particularly important as we contemplate capital investment. Capital investment is the economy's canary in the mine because it's often the first thing that succumbs to uncertainty. Also, once undertaken, capital investment is costly to reverse. Another reason a business is always proceeding with caution when they contemplate job creating capex. Investment has certainly been unusually sluggish in the wake of the recent recession. Uh, going back to when the data began, our data at least, in 1947, net investment as a percentage of GDP has fluctuated around a constant mean of 5.6%. It boomed in the late 1990s, reaching 8.1% of GDP. That was its highest level in over 50 years. Incidentally, John, the only higher quarter on record was the second quarter of 1950, shortly after you and I came into this world. I'm not implying any causality. The peak of net investments or percentage of GDP during the 2001-2007 expansion was an unremarkable 6.9%, but the subsequent plunge was unprecedented in post-World War II history. The U.S. capital stock actually shrank during the second half of 2009 relative to its 5.6% long-run average net investment as a percent of GDP, fell by twice as far as it had during any prior post-war recession. More to the point, the recovery in investment has been exceptionally anemic. Today, four full years after the trough of the recession in the second quarter of 2009, net investment as a percentage of GDP is still only 3.2%, a level typical of past recession lows. Net investment as a percentage of GDP was last at or above its 5.6 long-term, long-run mean six and a half years ago. Small wonder that non-farm payroll employment has been so slow to recover. Through August, we had restored less than 80% of the 8.7 million jobs lost during the Great Recession. Less well-known is the fact that real GDP per capita only recovered its pre-recession peak this past summer. That's five and a half years to make up the ground lost during the recession. Previous World War II recoveries never required more than nine quarters maximum. A Dallas Fed analysis suggests that the recent financial crisis and its aftermath put the U.S. back by more than an entire year's worth of output an equivalent of $120,000 per American household. So what of uncertainty? 
Well, I mentioned earlier that we now have several uncertainty indices. One of those focused on measuring policy uncertainty was developed by our moderator, Nick Bloom, together with Scott Baker at Stanford and Stephen Davis at Chicago. The index is based on three different types of information. First, a count of, I hope I get this right, but the first is a count of articles referencing uncertainty, the economy and policy that have appeared in prominent US newspapers, the most prominent of which is the Dallas Morning News. <laughs> Second, a weighted count of tax code provisions that are scheduled to expire, creating uncertainty about what might ensue. And three, the extent to which professional forecasters disagree with one another about future levels of inflation and government purchases. This Baker Bloom Davis index begins in January of 1985 and runs through the present. And I could walk you through, and I have in my prepared remarks, how it has varied over time. But and one thing that is clear is I fully expect that in the wake of this past week's developments, we will see an increase in that index that underscores the amount of uncertainty. The point is that starting with the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, economic policy uncertainty has been consistently high. And half the time, it has been extraordinarily high by this index and by other reliable indices. It's difficult to prove, of course, beyond a reasonable doubt that this elevated uncertainty is causally related to the weak recovery we've experienced. But the hypothesis is surely sensible. The timing is certainly auspicious. And enough careful confirming analysis has been done to say that the preponderance of evidence favors the proposition that not just recent policy decision, but also the manner in which those decisions were arrived at have been a significant hindrance to economic expansion. Now, this is a section of speech that I call the kinky stuff, monetary policy. <laughs> so as to monetary policy, I would submit that there are several links between monetary policy and economic uncertainty. But first, a little background just so we're all on the same plane. Ordinarily, monetary policy works by influencing the current and expected near-term levels of short-term interest rates. Now, once short-term interest rates hit zero, however, the Fed, of course, turned to unconventional policies by using massive purchases of longer-term treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. These policies helped hold down term premium and supported the housing recovery. Simultaneously, the Fed tried, and I emphasize tried, because the message seems to have been garbled in the minds of some intended recipients. Tried to influence expectation of its own behavior once asset purchases had run their course. So these asset purchase and so-called forward guidance policies are relatively unfamiliar, and their impact is uncertain as it impacts decision-making in the private sector. One implication is that aggregate fiscal shocks, and hence also aggregate fiscal uncertainties, are likely to have outsized effects in current circumstances. Contractional fiscal policy that would ordinarily drive down interest rates, providing offsetting stimulus to private expenditure, will have a larger than typical economic impact because this crowding in is absent once interest rates are confined to the zero lower bound. Expansionary fiscal policy, similarly, will fail to crowd out private investment if interest rates are held steady. Second, because the zero bound complicates the conduct of monetary policy and short circuits fiscal crowding out, it induces a kink or discontinuity in the economy's behavior. The existence of a kink means that uncertainty matters even if ordinarily it would not. Certainty equivalence, in other words, to use an economist term, no longer applies. When real growth and or inflation prospects are weak so that the economy is operating near the zero bound, downside risk to growth and inflation loom larger than they ordinarily would. More aggressive than usual policy responses may be appropriate to avoid the negative implications of an encounter with the zero bound. Paradoxically, however, once the lower bound on interest rates is binding, a less than usually aggressive monetary policy response may be the most appropriate one. I've tried to articulate this in the Federal Open Market Committee meetings ever since we started down the path of quantitative easing, drawing on anecdotal reports from my CEO contacts and what I thought was common sense. 
but my arguments fell on deaf ears until one of my more learned and credentialed counterparts at the San Francisco Fed, John Williams, produced a formal study that posited that the aggressive use of unfamiliar policy tools like quantitative easing and operation twist add to aggregate economic uncertainty. And if applied at all, they need to be deployed more cautiously than our more familiar tools. In general, the objective of monetary policy is to provide households and firms with an economic environment that makes it attractive to use money as a medium of exchange and a store of value. Since many private contracts, including labor and debt contracts, as well as capital expenditure commitments, extend out several years, a multi-year policy perspective is needed. A multi-year perspective is especially important, I would submit, when the economy may encounter the zero bound that we currently have. And the explanation is that by interfering with the normal conduct of monetary policy, the zero bound increases the likelihood that policy will miss its objectives year after year in the same direction. So the errors accumulate over time. Let me just give you some numbers. For the past five years, for example, uh, personal consumption expenditure inflation has averaged 1.2% a year. As you know, the Federal Open Market Committee's announced long-term inflation objective is 2%. Now, over a single year, the difference between 1.2% and 2% is inconsequential. Over five years, though, that same small difference accumulates to 4.26% point difference in the price level, which is, by the way, not insignificant if back in 2008 you took out a mortgage with a five-year balloon. Alternatively, nominal GDP growth over the past five years has averaged 2.4% per year, when ordinarily one might expect to have had 4.5% average annual growth. That's 2.5% real growth plus 2.0% inflation. Again, that differential is inconsequential for a year, but accumulated over five years, the level of nominal income today is fully 12% below what might reasonably have been expected when mortgage and auto loan agreements were made back in 2008. I want you to please note, and particularly the press, I'm not advocating any change in the Federal Open Market Committee's 2% inflation target. My point is simply to highlight the longer-term consequence of what might appear to be smallish, short-term deviations from the norm. Business operators plan capex and payrolls not in one or two or even three-year segments, they plan and budget over longer-term horizons. The nominal stability that people need if they're going to negotiate multi-year contracts is a multi-year nominal stability. A policy that lets bygones be bygones from year to year may not achieve this kind of stability, especially when policy options can become constrained in the short term by the zero bound. A policy that takes a longer-term perspective and is properly communicated and executed so as to instill confidence that monetary policy will hew to a 2% inflation target rather than fixate on the run rate of the past four quarters or the outlook for the next four, I would submit, or we would submit the Dallas Fed, may better supply the longer term comfort that households and businesses need to plan and budget. Such a policy would reduce the uncertainty that monetary policy as it is currently conducted spawns and would be more effective in doing its part to assist in economic expansion. I see you're still awake, and I hope that this is enough to get a conversation started. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to John Taylor. In doing so, I'm reminded, <laughs> of all things, of Ross Perot's quip when he was placed between Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush for a pre-debate photograph in the 1992 presidential election. Noting that Mr. Perot was substantially shorter than the other two men, a reporter asked him how he felt, and his reply was, I feel like a dime between two nickels. <laughs> well, in contrast, compared to John Taylor, I feel like an intellectual dwarf, a mere penny sitting on the dais next to John's $100 bill drain. That's our largest note, as you know. And, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm talking about the new difficult to replicate $100 bill <laughs> that we're going to release next Tuesday. So please wel welcome John Taylor to the podcast. Okay.
That was a great speech, Richard. <laughs> um, it's always good to come to the podium when the audience is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, thank you for a uh, for wonderful set of remarks, and, and thank you for all you're doing. It's an honor for me to be involved with your Globalization of Monterey Institute, and uh, it's, it's an important thing for the Federal Reserve System to be doing that, and, and Dallas is a great place uh, for it. And, and thanks for speaking out and uh, helping to educate people about monetary policy so often. Um, I'm also glad to be on the podium here with uh, my colleague, Nick Bloom. So rather than speaking to a group of Stanford students uh, today, we're speaking to a great group from, of Texas, from Texas. And I have to note, there are some uh, comparisons between our state of California and the state of Texas. We hear it all the time. In fact, I wouldn't be too surprised if several of you in the audience have not recently moved from California. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of other people have. So this is a, uh, a conference we're having today about uncertainty and its impact on the economy. And our remarks and our discussion in a few minutes are focused on that. And so I'd like to talk about uncertainty in kind of a broad sense of, of the word, the way I've been thinking about it for, for a while over time, and, and give it some historical perspective as well. So first of all, as, as Richard mentioned, U.S. economy is, is underperforming now in, in many, many dimensions. It's, it's really, for, for me, it's a dis really a disappointment. I feel frustrated we couldn't be doing better uh, with our economy. This recovery, um, while it is a recovery, has, is remarkably slow by historical standards. After deep recessions, economy, U.S. economy recovers much more rapidly, but the growth rate has been just barely over 2% since the recovery began, and that compares to over 5% over a similar period of time when our last deep recession occurred in the early 1980s. The unemployment has come down a bit, but a lot of that coming down is because people have dropped out of the labor force. The, the fraction of people uh, who are working, the, the fraction of the working age population is working is now lower than at the beginning of the recovery. Uh, median incomes have declined, and, and remarkably, the income distribution in the country has widened. People have talked about income distribution a lot, but it's widened because both the lower groups and the upper groups have not done so well over this period of time. So there's a lot of problems, and when I think about the problems, and economists think about it all the time, we're debating it constantly, there's various explanations and, and ideas that people put through. One is that, hey, after such a deep crisis and a serious crisis, it's natural to take a while before you get back to normal. You know, but history doesn't really show that. Uh, recoveries from deep recessions are faster. Maybe there's something different this time, but it's certainly not an automatic that it takes a while to recover after a deep recession. Some people mentioned deleveraging, the, the, the fact that so much was borrowed going into this, it takes a while to get the debt down, and that means people have to save more, consume less, and so the economy is sluggish. But that doesn't really work either, because our save, savings rates are actually quite low, historically speaking, and, and much lower than they were in the early 1980s, when we had a much more rapid recovery. So there's other explanations that are, that are out there, but when I go down the list and think about it, the thing that... I, get, I settle to settle on, if you like, and, and have for a while, is the problem really has to do with, with policy, economic policy. And a lot of that is the policy uncertainty, broadly speaking. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I don't think of it, policy uncertainty as, as, as in such a narrow way that it would, it would spike, say, now, because of the debates about the, the, uh, the budget and the shutdown. Of course it spikes at times like this, but to me, periods of where the problem, they're, they're longer than that. They're real, it's really more like a climate change rather than a day-to-day a -day weather change. And the indices are hard to measure those climate changes. Uh, they're, they're attuned to the more shorter-term things, but I, I like to think of it, this is a longer-term uh, thing that we're going through. And I tend to characterize it basically, in terms of just basic economic principles, I think of the problems are when we deviate from these principles, that causes uncertainty, it causes unpredictability. And I like, to, I like to list the principles that I, I teach, teach my students at Stanford and other places as sort of five basic things. One, good economic policy should be predictable. It should be based on the rule of law. It, it should emphasize markets, which creates, number four, good incentives. And for the most part, a limited role for government. 
And by, I mean limited role for government, I mean a role that has been rationalized and justified through basic cost-benefit analysis. Government should do what it should be doing, the private, and the rest should be left to the private sector. Those are sort of prin basic principles. And I think, actually, in many respects, the United States of America has done well over the centuries because we've tended to adhere to those principles. But we also had, have had swings in these principles. And we're going through a swing now. But you can, you can see the swings over, over decades. A period where we were really bad on these principles. And there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unpredictability, a lot of movements away from rule of law was the late 60s and 70s. We had a monetary policy which was incredibly unpredictable. Go stop. The Fed would, would accelerate or pull back, accelerate, pull back. Uh, and it caused a lot of damage. Inflation picked up over time and unemployment picked up over time. We, I think we had a fiscal policy then which was sort of very emphasis, emphasis on these sh shorter term temporary stimuluses. We had a d d diversion from the market system big time. Wage and price controls were imposed on the entire economy in the Nixon administration. So you can go on on, on, these, on these principles. All those things create unpredictability. Imagine the government is going to control all prices and wages in the economy for some unspecified period of time. Huge uncertainty. But it's more, cl it's more climactic, right? It lasts a while. It's not just one day. It's not just one week. It lasts for quite a while. That was the 70s. P performance was terrible. Then we move into a period starting in the late 70s into the 80s and until recently where, where we changed quite a bit of that. Monetary policy actually became much more predictable. People began to figure out a little bit what was doing. It was started with Volcker, uh, continued with a good fraction of Greenspan's term. Fiscal policy, we got a, a, away from those temporary, I call stimulus packages, and moved to just basically let's try to have our tax system stable, tax reform, uh, President Bush, 41, didn't do a stimulus package in the recession. President Clinton didn't do a stimulus package in the recession. Fiscal policy was more predictable as well. Uh, we actually tended to move back towards uh, re reliance on markets. Regulation in the economy uh, declined compared to the 1970s. So all these things, I think, are in the, in the realm of producing greater certainty about economic policy, relying on the markets more for example, less on the, on the whims of, of policymakers. And then we had, more recently, I don't know when it started exactly, it's certainly not in the last five years, it's before that, where policy, I think, became less predictable again. We started to move towards the fiscal policy with these temporary stimulus packages. Remember, there was a tax rebate in early 2008. It didn't do much good that I can, tell, I can see at all. Um, we, we, we had a monetary policy. Um, moved in a way which I think was quite unpredictable. And Richard just talked about this as well. In 2003, 4, and 5, had these interest rates which were very low by the standards of the 80s and 90s for the circumstances that existed. No question, that was a deviation from a more predictable, rule-like monetary policy which we, which we had for a good couple of decades. And, and remember, the performance in the, in the 80s and 90s until recently was pretty good. Economists called it a great moderation because it was so good. We, we had m very minor business cycles, modest business cycles, and, and really pretty steady growth. We got off of that with monetary policy, as I indicated. And if you continue now with monetary policy, I think it's very hard to predict what's going on, whether you like it or not. Uh, just the debate about tapering, just a, a massive change. Just think of it as a December of last year, Federal Reserve is talking about $85 billion a month purchases. That's QE3. As far as we could tell, it was going to last for a long time. Then only five months later, they came out and said, oh, we're going to taper. So it changed a completely new thing. And then just a couple of months later, the reverse, going back to the QE3. We we'll call it new, new QE3. So it's just an example, really, I think, of where policy has become much less predictable. And I think that causes damage to the economy. So your fiscal policy, monetary policy, I'd say in terms of markets, let's face it, there is a little less reliance or maybe a big less reliance on markets. The healthcare law is, is that way. The Dodd-Frank financial reform tends to be that way. The purposes, the intentions are good, but it's moving away from the reliance on markets and incentives. And to some extent, we're going back where we worry about changes in the rule of law, the bailouts, whether you like them or not, violated the rule of the bankruptcy code. 
and, and, and some of the special things that are done now to give uh, exemptions for firms with the new law. So by and large, it seems to me we have a lot of historical evidence in the United States, I'd say in other countries too, about the kind of policies that work pretty well and that don't work pretty well. They do, in my view, fall under the rubric of more certain policies and less certain policies, more uncertain. You might say it's more predictable, less predictable. You might say it's more rule-like, less rule-like. You might say it's more reliance on markets, less reliance on markets. But it's all kind of the same thing that is going on. And as I say these things, and I give these historical examples, those are broad historical trends. Actually, you can learn a lot from those broad historical trends. But you also can look at episodes each, in each of these periods. You can study quantitative easing carefully, as Richard mentioned that John Williams has done. You can study carefully stimulus packages. And you can do research, like we're talking about at this conference. In the late 1970s, um, two people who later won Nobel Prizes, Robert Lucas and Tom Sargent, wrote a paper which was really a devastating critique of the policies that were being used then. They call it after Keynesian macroeconomics. I think it had a lot to do with the change in policy that occurred for a good 20, 25 years. So th there's research that supports what I'm saying. If you like, there's some smoking guns that underlie the general historical ideas. Now, just to conclude, it may sound like this is a kind of a pessimistic story. What are we gonna do? But in a way, there's a lot of optimism here because if what I'm saying is correct, it's pretty easy to solve. You just go back to the kinds of policies that worked well in the past, the kinds of policies that created great moderation, the kinds of policies that had rapid economic growth, the kinds of policies where unemployment came down and, and employment grew. The world is different. It's more integrated. The Globalization and Monetary Policy Institute is studying that. So you just can't go back in past, to the past and do the same thing. But, but these principles, these five principles, are to me kind of universal. And you find ways to apply them in this new, much more complicated world that is, a, is awash in change. And I think if we do that, there should be a lot of reasons to expect we'll get back to the kind of performance which was so good in the past. Thank you. All right, we're on next. So, um, thank you very much, Richard and John, for the uh, fantastic talks. Um, it's my pleasure as moderator now to open the floor to questions. Um, before, you before you start with the question, please state your name and your institution. And while the first question is being lined up, I'm going to take moderator's privilege to, to ask a question myself, which is, what do you think the uh, impact of the government shutdown has been in terms of both obviously directly from the shutdown itself, but also indirectly through, I think, pushing up uh, government policy uncertainty even higher than it was already? John, you take a first cut. Well, I think it's an uh, indication that we are still in this world where there's a lot of policy uncertainty. Um, I mean, this is not the first episode we've had recently about this. There was 2011, the debt limit, there was the fiscal cliff, which was just not that long ago. Remember, the fiscal cliff was paralyzing a lot of us. So to me, it's an uh, example where you got a storm, but the storm is a symptom of a, of a climate problem that we have with respect to policy uh, in general. I think it reflects a deep-seated uh, disagreement, too, about where we should be going in our country. Uh, we talk about uh, problems with partisanship and people not getting together enough. I think that's also what you're seeing here. So it's both an ideological divide, plus, for some reason, an unusual inability for people to get together and work it out. I tend to look at things, again, through a globalized perspective or from a globalization perspective. My general view is that we have a fiscal policy, both on the tax side and the spend side, that is still Cold War oriented. In other words, it's the accumulation of lobby after lobby after lobby for generations, as though the world hadn't changed. The focus should be on job creation. Jobs are the route to dignity. I know this from my own family history. And uh, I think that's accepted on both sides of the aisle. The question is how you incent people to create jobs in a globalized world where factors have shifted. I think the one thing that we could agree on 
Republican or Democrat is, and I've said this many times, we won. The wall came down. We brought people into the system. We shed a generation of blood and treasure to get that done. And now, instead of, in my generation, killing the Vietnamese and having them kill us, we sell their products. Most golf hats, by the way, in America have American flag on it, are made in Vietnam. I find that very interesting, or Bangladesh or wherever. And we sell their bonds and we invest in each other. So I, I think you know, the markets and technology and the net have all acclimated to a new world. Policymakers have not. We have, John knows this, we still struggle in terms of, say, the Taylor Rule and putting that in an international context in the context of globalization, one of the things that we're studying. But I think part of this reflects, it's almost like being frozen in the headlights. You're not quite sure what to do. You know that the objective should be to put Americans back to work. There are differences of opinion. But how do you do it in a cyberized, globalized world? So I'm not surprised it's taking a great deal of time. I'll be careful about how I say this, but you need leadership to get that done. And I'm not talking about just the White House. I'm talking about in the upper house and lower house of those that make the federal rules that dominate our lives and the regulations and the taxes and spending. And I, the one thing I'll say on behalf of the Fed, even though we might have disagreements of how we've conducted policy, is we actually do things. We actually make policy. We announce it after every meeting, and we do it, even though we might have fierce disagreements at the table, we love each other afterwards. It's a civil way to conduct policy. Uh, you don't see that elsewhere in Washington, and I don't think we will get up to the modern status that we need in a cyberized, globalized world until somehow we get the leadership that guides us in that direction. Just have a healthy discussion. I'm working very hard to avoid answering your question. <laughs> 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 I, I this, is, this is the best trade of a central banker. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, I'm, I'm now going to open the floor to questions. Um, at the front, Shush, I think it was. Uh, Do you want to, uh, sorry, again, please, if you could say your name. and, and Patricia Patterson, Patricia Patterson, Patterson Investments. This is not a question. It's just to inform the dialogue. But it just came across my cell phone that Mr. Boehner has just announced that he will not allow the government to go into default. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a question of it. We'll see if that uh, reduces uncertainty or not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps. Uh, my name's Andy Jacobs. I'm CEO of a residential mortgage REIT invested in mortgage agency-backed mortgage-backed securities, leveraged. Uh, my question, using your uncertainty, I look at this as from the degree of unintended consequences. Because a lot of the policies that you're, that, you know, I, I borrow a lot of money through the repo market and, and the world repo system, uh, a whole lot of money. Uh, the concept, one of the, uh, the Fed's tools to remove liquidity out of the system has been discussed is the Fed using the repo market as well in, in, in repoing part of their vast quantity measured in trillions of either treasuries or mortgage-backed securities is in entering that repo market. Well, the repo market I deal with is, you know, on a daily basis is two to four trillion dollars. That's a big number. But when the Fed comes in with a balance sheet with, you know, two or three trillion dollars worth of repo and how do, that's going to take a big chunk, chunk of capacity out of the system. So it's going to do a very good job, y'all repoing uh, these securities to remove liquidity. But what you've done is you're, you're crowding out other people that are in this market, like my type company, and so people that run type to portfolios, we're in residential mortgage-backed securities. So when you come in and you crowd us out and you increase our cost of borrowings, it, at the end of the day, somewhere down the road is it's going to manufacture, it's going to get into home values. It's going to get back to the consumer. So. What, you know, how do y'all look at, in your policy, the going and jumping into repo, how do you look at what's going to happen five years down the road or three years down the road? What's going to ha happen with what you're doing relative to, in our case, housing policy? It, you know, what does it do, do to housing values? You know, we lost six or seven trillion in housing values through this crisis. If you, you know, how much more can we afford to, for it to tick down? Uh, because I think that's a driver for this economy. We've, we've stabilized. So the question is, 
the unintended consequences of not only your policy, but also the Dodd-Frank and the banking regulations too. So how does it, how does it work its way back into, in our case, home values, and how does that impact the way you look at things? Very long question, sorry. That's right. I like to say it's a good statement disguised as a question. Um, <laughs> first of all, I don't want to bore the audience, and we could talk about this separately. You could talk with my team, but we're running what we call small-scale experiments and tests of the marketplace. We've announced these publicly to ameliorate some of that pressure that you just articulated. Now, small-scale in our case are $100 billion per diem. Uh, transactions or working within that repo market. We just announced it. I think it would bore everybody to tears if I walked you through it, but we could talk about that separately. And the obvious intention of the accumulation of mortgage-backed securities and uh, the build-up to a balance sheet that is fast approaching four trillion from 900 billion where we were, at least on the mortgage-backed security side, was to revitalize the housing market. I think we. I actually supported the first tranche of that. I, I don't like it in the sense that we're getting involved with a specific asset class, but I do think it was there was efficacy to what we did there. Not so sure about the Treasury's side in terms of job creation and its ultimate influence. Um, and you're absolutely right. In each of these discussions we have, we're not just saying we want to do this and have an immediate impact. The question is, further down the road, how do we get out of whatever momentary distortion, and I use that in a positive way, we've deliberately created in a marketplace in order to restore or lift up a market. This is a subject of ongoing discussion, and that's why we're running some of these shorter term, small scale operations, 100 billion, uh, in order to make sure that we're not influencing the market, either crowding people out or somehow adding to volatility in a way that comes back to bite us in the end and hurts your function as providing stability and predictability in the marketplace. But again, to get to the specifics of your question, I would refer you to what we just announced. In fact, we announced it right after our last meeting. And if you wish to talk about it further, I'd be happy to put my staff in touch with you. I don't know if you want to even touch on this, John. Well, just but, very but briefly, the unintended consequence thing is a very important thing. Just very briefly, because I think the, the broader aspect of the question, unintended consequences, is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're doing now at the Fed is completely unprecedented. So there's many things that we don't know the effects. Basically, the short-term the short money market is effectively non-existent because there's, it doesn't rely on the supply and demand reserves. So what's the impact of that in terms of funds flowing around the country? Um, pricing securities is very hard when the biggest player in town now, long term, is the Fed. Uh, the the mortgage-backed securities market itself uh, is uh, greatly influenced by one player. It's it is really unusual, and it's it's part of this uncertain aspect. I mean, un, unintended consequences means you don't know what they are. That's the uncertainty. You know these un imbalances, and so I worry a lot about the imbalances. I've been writing uh, to critique quantitative easing since it began. And by the way, one thing that's important to keep in mind is the actions of the Fed, I believe, during the panic in, say, September, October, November 2008, that was very, very good. It's hard to complain. It was classic central banking in many respects. It was the same thing that happened in 2001 with 9-11. Clearly, it was pumped in. It was more. But it, it, it wasn't, it was, it was, it stayed. It wasn't taken out. It was, it was doubled and tripled and quadrupled. And so it is a real concern. And you know, we don't have models that, an, that know this. We have, we have economic models for certain things. Very, and the models that exist are very poor, very unreliable, huge amount of debate amongst economists. When the Fed says this policy increased growth by X percent, I just say that I would almost try to be diplomatic here. I think that's garbage. We do not know. We do not know that uh, its impact. So you have to be very wary. And I. I Agree with your, your policy, your, your, you know, your statement. The, the numbers are pretty strong. We, we're getting close to taking down 100% of the gross issuance of mortgage-backed securities. We have 35% of the stock of treasuries. Right. As John mentioned, we've moved out on the yield curve, so our average duration is much longer. And these shorter-term instruments, which used to be the, the basic stuff of the system open market account, are no longer there. 
And only half jokingly, I remind my colleagues that we did learn something from the Hunt brothers here in Texas, <laughs> which is when you're on the buy side, things look great. But even in highly liquid markets like this, when you have this kind of concentration, when you're on the sell side, and we get to that point, things look different. And I, I have argued and I have worried about what kind of volatility, what kind of instability that might create should we get to that position. Or how do we navigate our way around it? And how do we navigate around it without creating new Rube Goldberg devices that might make it even harder to understand what we're doing? You know, we, we, the intention was to get more back into the marketplace. I mentioned housing in particular. I think it did help the turn. Um, but what we've seen is a buildup of excess reserves on our balance sheet. There's a prominent banker sitting right in front of me, and he has excess reserves sitting on our balance sheet. He'd rather be lending that money into the marketplace. We're getting up into the trillions of excess reserves. At some point, that will come coursing, if hopefully, back into the economy. Then there's a the question of how we titrate all that. And, you know, as John said, we've never been through this before. Just one other thing, the playbook that we followed during the crisis was written in 1825. Uh, and that did work well. The playbook we're following now has never been written before. We're writing it. And that makes John Taylor and me and, by the way, my colleagues, um, of course, eager to try to get it right. It also creates a little bit of angst. Okay. Um, I see a question table behind. There's one way back there, too. And then. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Neil Osman, a local CPA, mostly uh, dealing with clients in the healthcare services side. Uh, and uh, from, uh, uh, so I want to ask about the uncertainty in the numbers themselves that uh, Mr. Fisher mentioned earlier. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, my clients might have spent 80% of their time focusing on core performance, 20% on avoidance. Uh, today, it seems like we spend uh, 30, 40, 50% of our time on avoidance and the balance on uh, dealing with core performance issues. So wh where is that reflected in, in the economic analysis that's performed in models today, this, uh, this turn in business towards uh, more internal performance uh, uh, issues uh, dealing with the HIPAA Act and, and a variety of the other uh, uh, issues out there. And then secondly, I'd like to know if the economists really rely on the CBA scoring for the Affordable Care Act, which uh, I find lots of problems with. Nick, do you want you guys go ahead and answer the first one? <laughs> uh, maybe we should let Nick answer that one. Maybe, yeah, actually that's a good idea. Nick. Um, great idea. I mean, I, 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 I think it's a good question. It links very much into the, you know, the concepts of uncertainty is the more uncertain, the more, com the more complex the tax system has become, the more uncertain it's become, but also the more time you spend trying to avoid it. Actually, I mean, you can all hear I'm British. I worked in the UK Treasury back in the early 2000s uh, doing corporate tax, and I noticed already back then when I was working the uh, inland revenue, the amount of time firms spent trying to avoid paying taxes, and the reason was the tax system just become much more Complex, and I think with complexity becomes uncertainty. It's really part of the same phenomena. So, you know, as the tax system, as uh, Richard said, is you know grown and grown as you know groups of special interest groups have put in you know riders and additional riders. The thing has become more unpredictable, but necessarily it's also become more invasive. As a Brit moving over here, I'm also astounded by the complexity of the personal taxes I have to file. I mean, four sets AMT and you know alternative minimum tax regular, both state and federal. Um, so with complexity, there's also uncertainty. I think it's a huge burden. It would be best avoided, and tax simplification would have two benefits. One of the things that's in uh, the index that Nick and Steve Davis has worked on is the number of provisions in the tax code that expires each year. And uh, that has really, since the last 10 or 12 years, is just like an explosive line. And uh, to some extent, it, the, the fiscal cliff resolved a bit of that because we made effectively permanent the uh, big chunk of the Bush tax cuts. But still, is this gigantic increase in uncertainty that's caused by so many provisions or temporary. It's this temporary thing. It's, economists somehow got the notion that if we did things just for a little while, it would better be better. The, the, the mantra was uh, temporary, targeted, 
forget the third one. Uh, anyway, timely. there you go, timely, temporary targeted and timely. And I think it just has, has not worked. Temporary, that means things, things change in the future. So I like to say permanent, pervasive, and predictable. <laughs> On those three. And he, he also asked about the Affordable Health Care Act, I believe. I find when I, before every FOMC meeting, I have about 50 CEOs around the world, public, private, large, medium, and small. I usually get to 30 some odd of them. I hear more about this than any other subject matter. Why? Because labor is the dominant cost factor in any business, service sector, or which is the predominant part of our economy or non-service sector. And if you're trying to figure out what the true cost of labor is, you have to figure in social overhead. Uh, and I'll say this because he says it himself. If Rex Tillerson of Exxon Corporation tells you, as he tells me, they cannot figure out what the cost is gonna be, how do you expect a woman that runs a dry cleaning business that owns, has 100 employees or whatever, the, a widget business? You know this is a CPA. Uh, it creates enormous uncertainty at a time where we're trying to create or incent people to create more jobs. But to actually figure out how much it costs to employ somebody and where this is gonna, how this is going to be allocated is become increasingly difficult, particularly as the Federal Register, not just because of that act, but it's become thicker and thicker and wider and wider and taller and taller. But the one issue that everybody talks about, regardless of size, regardless of being public or private, is the Affordable Health Care Act. And as we see every morning, as there was in the New York Times this morning, the second best paper in the United States next to the <laughs> Dallas Morning News, um, the, uh, you know, there are little aspects of that that seem not to quite function. That creates additional uncertainty. So it's pretty clear to me that this is something that needs to be more clearly addressed, and you talk about unintended consequences, should have been thought through before. Now, how it works its way into the models, I'm not sure, because I don't build and operate models like you do, Nick. <laughs> okay, thank you, but there's a question in the second table right in front of me. Thank you, Carlos Martinez, Richland College. Uh, I understand um, over-regulation, Obamacare, Dodd-Frank's, HIPAA, but isn't that a, a response to the lack of confidence that the average American has in our, in our system? I mean, the confidence that the average person today holds in our institution is very low. And so how do you rebuild that confidence? Yeah, so I, I agree very much that that's what the polls show, the confidence in government is at a low point. Actually, the Congress is as low as you can go now. Uh, but um, I think that doesn't mean the government should be doing more things, necessarily. Uh, it may be a symptom that they're trying to do too many things and, and not doing so well at, the, at some of those things, and people can see that. It's actually one of, the, one of the agencies of government that is most highly thought of as the military. And for whatever reason, they seem to be able to get jobs done that they're assigned to get. Uh, they they're sometimes are assigned to do too many things they shouldn't be doing, but because they're so good at it, and they do pretty well. So, so I think it's, it's, to me, a symptom that we're trying to do things that we probably shouldn't be doing. It may be one way to read it. And so I say, so, so, so t say for example, in going back to my examples of history, in the 1990s, there was a massive change in, in welfare. And basically, that was to move a lot of the decisions out of the federal government to states, local governments. And um, it had other parts of the reform to it. But it was, if you like, a devolution of responsibility from the federal government to the states. And I think, in retrospect, many people think that worked very well. And so some of the proposals now for health care or Medicaid, whatever, are of that variety to try to get, get if you like, the decisions made more at the local level where people know what's going on, where they might have more faith in the representatives. So, so I think it's a very important thing for, for government to address. Richard mentioned leadership is so important, and so if you don't have the leaders that are generating that confidence, then that's, that's a problem. So I'd say it's, if you like, governance 
is really like a, a huge issue now. For, I mean, this, this thing with the shutdown, that's a, go, a governance failure, right? I mean, there's something has in this system who, without pointing fingers to somebody, shouldn't have this happening in this type of thing. We've had it in the past, but we haven't had it for a while. So I think it's a, it's a real governance problem. Can I, can I just say something to try to give you some optimism? But um, I would argue that the private sector is as fit and ready to compete in this country as it ever has been. I would argue that our public and publicly held and privately held enterprises have in part because of a 32 year bond market rally, which we added the crescendo to, maybe we did too much, maybe we did too little, that's not the point. But they have repositioned themselves financially. They have driven the technology that comes out of Silicon Valley and actually started here with a semiconductor here in Dallas and elsewhere to maximize productivity. We are lean and we are fit and muscular and ready to roll. Uh, and you also have to ask yourself, compared to what else? Compared to Europe? Or pick another part of the world? So I've often said, and I've said it too many times perhaps, we have to switch from being the best looking horse in the glue factory, which is what we are now, to being the greatest thoroughbred. I don't think it's that difficult because here we are at the Fed, we've filled the gas tank, it's brimming over with cheap high octane fuel, liquidity, zero cost money. It's useless unless someone puts their foot on the accelerator and drives our economy forward through job creation and creating greater prosperity. Who's responsible for doing that? The Congress of the United States. They decide how much they tax, how much they spend, and what they regulate. And I just wish to God they would put their brains behind just doing that. I think it can be done. I don't see it happening elsewhere. In fact, I see it much worse in other parts of the world. So I'll tell you who's responsible. You are. Look at yourself in the mirror in the morning. You elect these people. You have the power to change it. And, and by the way, it's not, you don't elect monetary policy officials. You elect the people that decide how they incent people to use money. So I just wanted to put you in your place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a very high hand, I think it's... That lady. Yeah. Can, can I give a parochial answer and then John, you give a more erudite Absolutely. answer? Um, let me tell you where government policy works well. Right here in Texas. Uh, we passed, our legislature, Democrats and Republicans, passed a law that limited how much you could borrow against the uh, assessed value of your home. Now, some would argue that that's government interference. It was one of the key tools that kept us away from the housing debacle that occurred elsewhere in the United States. We have the same monetary policy as the rest of the country. Same interest rates prevail here in Texas. You worry about taxes in California. You come here, you'll do much, much better. So, and I'm very serious about this, and I talk on, based on the work that Pia Arrhenius and our staff, and Mene Yusel and others have done here. You look by income quartile, and people say, my friends in foreign countries, New York, for example, will say, you are great at creating low-income jobs in Texas. And I always say, yes, we are. We outproduce low-income jobs compared to the rest of the United States. We also happen to outproduce the highest quartile jobs compared to the rest of the United States. But more important than all are the two middle-income quartiles where we have for a decade had job destruction in the United States. Texas has been a place where we've had 
increases in the two middle income quartiles. We do have a state legislature. They do create laws and rules, and they incent people to take risk. And there's a lot of issues. We don't provide social services and so on. But somehow, this government has, under Democrats, Ann Richards or George Bush or Rick Perry, and the legislature has created incentives to do things well. So yes, government plays an important role, but it creates the proper incentives or it creates disincentives. They took action to not have to go through what we went through in the 80s in the housing market ever again or the real estate market. It was positive action. It was government action. I'd like to see more of that in Washington, D.C. So I just wanted to make a little plug here. But I think it's an example, John, that government can work. You live in a state where government doesn't work. <laughs> I, I talked about that at the beginning as a joke. I didn't mean to <laughs> keep driving it in. I don't, I don't think that the relationship between actions and certainty or uncertainty is correct. I think if actions are reasonably predictable, they don't need to cause uncertainty. You think, in, but when you sort of change the rules of the game in midstream, uh, people don't know about it, that's an action which is unpredictable and it causes uncertainty. Just think of some simple, simple examples. Uh, the, the law with respect to criminal activity. You want to have a police force that takes action when the law is broken, when a crime is committed. You don't want to keep changing the law about that all the time. So the action in that, case, in that sense creates certainty. You, when you commit a crime, you're going to pay a penalty. So, and then going back to the financial crisis, the, um, I'd say in many respects the problem was actions uh, which were unpredictable. The Bear Stearns action, uh, I think, surprised a lot of people. And I don't want to criticize that here. I wasn't, it wasn't in the room at the time. But once that decision was made to bail out the creditors of Bear Stearns, I think some clarity about what the policy going forward would be would be helpful. But instead, it was every expectation the same kind of action would be taken with respect to Lehman. And when it, it wasn't, that inaction was an incredible surprise. It created uncertainty. So, so the matching between actions and uncertainty is, is, is not one for one. Uh, as, as your question seemed to indicate. And, and I would add one other thing, if I may. If there is clarity and certainty, even if, say, business doesn't like what they get from the regulators or the fiscal policy makers, they'll figure out a way to work with it or around it. But they have to know what it is. We haven't had a budget for over five years in this country. We don't know where our tax rates are going. We have no idea what spending patterns are going to be. How does any businesswoman or man in this room to the degree that affects their business plan around it? Even if they don't like it, if it's known and it's known to be there for as long a time as is reliable, they can act. This is what this is all about. We are living in a time of maximum uncertainty. And that punishes what we drive for, which is prosperity through job creation. OK. Um, towards the back on the uh, left. I think this is uh, going to be the last question. Thank yeah, you my name is Vinod Sutari. I'm from Comerica Bank's risk group. The question I have is, uh, uh, in October 2008, uh, Alan Greenspan, during his congressional hearing, mentioned that he was shocked to see that market forces were not working. So essentially, he publicly kind of admitted that the market forces, the rationality thinking was not working. So the question for Dr. Taylor is, do you think it is time for us to rethink about the macro models and maybe give a chance to kind of a behavioral economics type of thinking, irrational kind of behavior of players? How can we incorporate those kind of thinking in our macro models? And some kind of thoughts on the future of macro models. That would be great. Thanks. So, I, so I think the behavioral finance and other What's innovations are very useful. We should be Six doing that. Now. It's uh, uh, a lot of promising work that's going on. And, and you certainly don't want to think models are good. You should leave them alone. They're just fine. That's, that's a terrible attitude to take. So you need to always be trying to improve models. But I have a problem blaming models or markets, quite frankly, on the crisis. Um, I think of the models were pretty much telling policymakers 
what to do. I think we're t telling them not to keep rates so low in 2003, four, and five. That was kind of what, not every model, but a lot of models said that. I think we have models that suggested that if you have uh, rules for financial institutions, you should enforce those rules, not kind of blink or not get caught up in a regulatory capture mode. So not all of these things uh, represent the failure of models or economics, and we can improve on them. And actually, we, we did learn a lot about the financial system. John Genicopoulos is in the first row. He's done a lot of work here on, the, um, on runs and the impact of, uh, of that kind of thing, which we have not modeled very, very carefully. So I think there's a lot more to do, but I would really not want to blame either markets or models on what happened. To me, it's much more policy. It's the, and basically tending not to follow these basic principles. My five, five principles are a model, they're a theory, they're a model. I think they work pretty well, um, always can be improved on. Nick? I was gonna write briefly follow up on John by saying, um, I mean, one of the things you learn in economics is the, the models are guides rather than uh, definitive predictions. They strike me as, you know, the weather prediction tomorrow is reasonably reliable. The weather prediction for next week is a rough guide, but you really don't want to count on it too much. And I see models in a very similar vein. This morning we had two papers by Larry Cristiano and Tony Yates were both excellent papers on related topics, but in both cases, you know, they were open about the broad range of predictions they came up with. And the thing that worries me in policymaking is when you see people incredibly convinced about their ideas on what's you know, the right action versus the wrong action, where things are going to be. In a sense, this is the problem in Washington right now, is you have people very convinced at either extreme. Uh, you know, as an economist, you think I couldn't possibly be that convinced because the models are, are broadly indicative, but they don't give me that certainty, and it makes me worried when people are so certain. Of course, this is where the deadlock comes out from. So, you know, I think uh, a, a certain, an, an important element of humbleness in the sense of they're useful guides, but they're really, uh, you know, no more useful than that. And as you point out, incorporating behavioral assumptions, going back to what Richard was mentioning earlier, is an important element of how we develop these. Well, I don't have much to add, but you mentioned Alan Greenspan and used the word, used the word humility. Um, I just want to end on a happier note just by telling you a little story. The last meeting he chaired at the FOMC, um, again, whether you think his policies were right or wrong as a leader, there is a comedy to the group, and it's a very civil discussion. And we like each other, even if we disagree and we argue against each other. So I decided I'd be incredibly clever and... I took Henry V's speech at Agincourt, we few, we precious few, and what a privilege <laughs> it had been to serve. And I truncated it, of course, but and someday it'll be released to the record. And when I was done, Alan said, uh, Richard, was that Shakespeare? I said, yes, it was, Mr. Chairman. He said, I went to high school with that guy. I've been around too long. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. <laughs>